lecture on feedback control. Uh, first of all, I want to inform you that we are trying to record a video of this stream, and this video should be downloadable by you afterwards if you want to go through the topics again. Uh, Alexi and Said will keep you posted on where to find this video. But uh, first of all, uh, I want to ask, are there any questions describing the last uh, lecture, which was uh, controller design in state space? Are there some questions that you want to state now? Okay, so no questions so far. Uh, if uh, some questions arise during your uh, studies, uh, send an email to Said and Alexi or try to contact them uh, some other way. They will try to answer and it's also possible, of course, to contact me. Uh, since there are no questions right now, I want to go to the new topic, which is chapter four, the analysis of nonlinear control systems using the describing function. Uh, so, until now, we were still focusing on linear systems with the root locus method, the state space description. Uh, everything was focused on purely linear systems. And now, for the first time, we are explicitly addressing nonlinear control systems. And just one word of caution nonlinearities cover a very wide range of different structures and system models. So every time that you're going to learn some nonlinear control or uh, analysis method, it is always uh, tailored for a specific uh, model of the nonlinearity. And it's always a strong restriction that is posed on the nonlinear structure. This is always the case, and this is, of course, also the case here for the describing function, as you will see soon. So uh, we start with the introduction. Uh, as I said, we are focusing on simple nonlinearities. As you can see here, uh, these uh, nonlinearities in example 4.1 uh, is uh, actually a simple controller. It's a so-called two-point controller because it's only outputting two different values of your control variable. Uh, and it's also called a relay uh, controller because it works like a relay. It's uh, either in the off or in the on state. Okay. Additionally, uh, you have this uh, hysteresis in here. And come to the hysteresis uh, back later. But what you can see here is that you have a control loop with a linear plant. This linear plant basically is some low pass filter. You have two real poles, meaning that there is some delay in here that you are storing some energy. This could be a water heater as it is uh, uh, given here in the example. But this, the same is also true for most of the heating systems. So when you're sitting now in your home office and it's cold outside and your heating is on, then typically the heating is working as it is done here. Okay, You have some set point. And please look at uh, the abscissa here. This is the control error. Okay, So zero here on the E is the same. Okay, this is your comfort temperature. And now, if the room temperature gets too low, you can see then you have a positive control error. Yeah? And in this case, the heating is turned on. On the other hand, if uh, the room temperature becomes too hot, which is corresponding to a negative control error, you see hot room temperature means large Y, and you're feeding it back in. So hot room means you get a negative value and the heating is switched off. And now the hysteresis, of course, is there because if you are in the vicinity of zero error and you have, and you always have, uh, some measurement noise, 
then you get very high frequency switching, which you don't want. And the hysteresis makes sure that switching is only done once you're passing this hysteresis switching point. Okay. Now, what is going to happen in such a when you look at the next page, you see that you're starting at some point, okay? This is the initial condition zero, and now you're uh, inputting a step input, okay? This, this would be, think of, uh, uh, for instance, an operating point that is first zero, and then you want to have your room temperature one degree higher, okay? One degree Celsius higher, and as you can see, the controller starts heating, yeah, U is one, and it heats up the room temperature until it's inside this uh, hysteresis bandwidth. And once it exceeds the bandwidth, the controller U switches off. Now the room is cooling down again. And when it's hitting the second threshold of the hysteresis, the uh, heating input is switched on again. So effectively, you're not asymptotically reaching your desired comfort temperature, which would be here plus one, but rather you're oscillating around this desired temperature, around this set point, and your control is always switched on and off. And as you can see, you're getting not a harmonic oscillation, but some other kind of oscillation. Nevertheless, it has some fixed amplitude and it has some fixed frequency, okay? And what is happening here, this is not a linear oscillator. This is only happening because of the nonlinearity and such a oscillation for, with a nonlinear element involved is called a limit cycle, okay? As you can see here, this is called limit cycle. I'm marking this in yellow. So the limit cycle, yeah, and you will, in, in a few minutes, you will see why this is called a cycle. This limit cycle is typical for nonlinear systems. Okay, there's a second example. This is also very important in terms of control design. In this example, you will find a PI controller. So that is a linear controller. Eventually, in the end of the uh, control loop, you see the plan, which again is purely linear transfer function, but in between the controller output is saturated. And that is, of course, always the case in reality. In reality, you never have a controller with unlimited uh, control amplitude. You always have limitations to the amplitude of your control variable U. So, in between these saturations, you have a perfect gain of one. There is no nonlinear distortion. Whatever the controller outputs in this intermediate range is directly fed into the plant. So everything is in the linear world. But once you're crossing the extreme value, which in this simple case is just one, everything gets cut off. And the output here is just one. Okay. What Whatever you're doing above one with your input to this nonlinear block, you're up here, and yet the output is just one. Okay, so effectively, this is not control anymore, but the plant runs in some open loop condition with a fixed constant input, which is the saturation. Okay, so that is something that is completely different from what we have seen until now, and it's very important because. These effects are going to happen, especially if the controller design is poor, okay? In this case, again, you're starting at some value, and instead of bringing the output variable down to the desired set point, yeah, which is zero in this case, you see that you're overshooting it, and then you're not settling, yeah? This is important. There is no damping. This limit cycle is in the sense that this amplitude prevails and also there's a fixed frequency again to this limit cycle. Okay. And again, if you remove this nonlinear element here, you would have, of course, some nice, stable, asymptotic linear behavior. Okay. 
This is not going to happen once you're exceeding the saturation threshold, then you get a limit cycle. So you see that these limit cycles are phenomena that exist in reality, and they are, I would say, quite likely to come up if you do a poor controller design, if you're neglecting the possible existence of a limit cycle. Okay. So there are important questions to be answered. The first one is, can limit cycles appear in a given control system? Yeah? As I said, you always have nonlinearities in reality. The simple one being this saturation. So can they appear? What is the, I would say, condition for existence? Now, if the answer is yes, then we know there is a limit cycle existing. And then, of course, we're interested in what are the amplitudes and what is the frequency of these limit cycles. Yeah? Just think of your room uh, heating system. Uh, as long as the frequency is not too high, because then this control valve of your heating system will wear out very soon and then it will break down. Okay, so you don't want it to switch every second or something. Yeah? Maybe it should be switching every, let's say, two to three minutes, maybe every 10 minutes. Yeah? But why shouldn't it switch every two hours? That would be even better for wear. Well, if it is switching only every two hours, then you can see that the control error will get too large. So the amplitude is somehow also associated with the frequency. So you're interested actually in both of those values. Okay. So this is an important question too. And then this, there is another topic. Is this limit cycle stable? Meaning will it appear under almost all conditions when it's a stable limit cycle? Is it unstable? Meaning that it will it might appear but only transient. Yeah? The, the stationary behavior will then be, again, asymptotic behavior because the limit cycle is unstable. And there is some in-between <laughs> characteristics. This is called a semi-stable limit cycle. We will see that later. And this is a, an important question then for the control. Is what measures do we have to take so that we can avoid limit cycles complete, okay? So, as I said before, you always have this saturation in the controller, yeah? It's inherently there because reality in physics, everything is limited. And if this limitation with the saturation is given, how do I design my controller such that this oscillatory behavior will not appear, okay? So, to answer all these questions, we need to do some, I would say, uh, we need to come up with some definitions. We have to go into some basic mathematics of describing uh, such systems. And that is what is given here uh, in, in this uh, preliminary uh, introduction. First of all, we're going to look at the structure of nonlinear control systems. In general, as we have seen before, G1, this transfer function, linear transfer function, could be the controller. G2 could be the transfer function of the linear plan. We could have another transfer function here for the measurements, G3. And in between, there is this nonlinearity. It's a static nonlinearity. The thing is that we can always transform this block diagram to a standard block diagram given down below here, okay? So if you look at uh, this, uh, I would say it's, a, it's a, a block diagram transformation, there is only one thing that you have to remember. If you do a transformation of this first block diagram, you cannot shift blocks across the nonlinearity, okay? So this is not like in the linear world where it doesn't matter if G1 or G2 comes first. Yeah? You could switch them because they are simply multiplied and multiplication is commutative. So that's simple. But if you have a nonlinearity, 
it's, uh, it does matter what comes first and what comes last, okay? So you cannot shift G2 simply before N, but you can only shift into the feedback loop, okay? And this is what is happening here. Yeah? You're, you're shifting effectively G1 up front here, and then you're shifting G1 and G3 back here and out here and in here, and you get this formulation. Now, you just have to remember that if you do this transformation, you get these additional blocks before your control loop and this second additional block behind your control loop. But if you look at the feedback control loop, then you get this standard form that we had before, where you have just first the nonlinearity, and after the static nonlinearity, you have a dynamic linear system represented. So what we have to look at is only this structure here. And this structure is called Hammerstein structure. This is named after a mathematician who treated the system first. And if we can prove all the dynamics for this system, then it's simple just to add this block before and the other block behind it. Okay, because these are just linear blocks. So the important structure that we have to look at is the Hammerstein structure. And uh, I, I just for the interest among you that there is, of course, another structure where this is switched, where you have first the linear block and then the nonlinear block. This would be called Wiener structure after Norbert Wiener, another one. Okay, so we just had this structure with a nonlinearity, and it is a static nonlinearity here, and this linear transfer function block here. Question is, what types of nonlinearities can? And basically, we can look at any type of nonlinearity. It's just a matter of parameterization how this uh, nonlinearity is modeled. For instance, look at the very first one up here, a. This could be originally some nonlinear function. However, this nonlinear function is approximated by piecewise linear function. Okay, so you have a, a continuous piecewise linear function here, which could be the approximation for some general characteristic. Yeah? The other types are not limitations of this method. This is just typical examples of what you will encounter in real technical systems. B is, for instance, pre-stress, okay? Think of some spring. If the spring is pre-stressed, you need uh, to overcome this minimum force of the pre-stress in order to expand or compress the spring, okay? So this is pre-stress. The other thing would be that you have a dead zone, meaning that there is some additional space before where you hit the spring to minimize the space, you have to reduce it to zero. And then, only then, you get the spring constant working. And if you go back the other way, then again, you have this dead zone and only then, again, you have the force in the other direction. Yeah? This, of course, D is the saturation function that we have all already looked at. E is uh, a simple two-point controller yeah, or the relay uh, function with hysteresis, okay? F would be saturation with a dead G is also interested. This is also call, called a three-point controller because it has the possibility of switching between three values like minus one, zero, plus one, okay? This third point in between is effectively working as a dead zone. Yeah? Uh, H would be a, a hysteresis together with uh, saturation. I would be the relay with uh, hysteresis. This would be a three-point uh, element with hysteresis. Here you have saturation with dead zone and hysteresis. And L, last but not least, is a so-called backlash, okay? Backlash is uh, typically encountered in gearboxes. So whenever you have gear transmission and you're looking 
at the absolute angle, how this angle is changed, and you're changing the direction of rotation, then there is always some play between the gears. And we've now seen we are focusing on Hammerstein structures. We're looking at static nonlinearities followed by a linear transfer function. And we're now defining what exactly is a limit cell. And the thing is that we're looking at the output y of our system, and we're defining the so-called phase by defining the abscissa y, and the ordinate is y dot. Okay. So in terms of the state space description that we have learned earlier in this course, we're effectively looking at only two states. The abscissa y would be x1 and the ordinate y dot would be x2, okay? And in this phase plane, a closed trajectory is called a limit cycle, okay? I'm, I'm going forward so that you can see this. This would be a stable limit cycle. Wherever you start, inside or outside, the trajectories in this phase plane with y dot here on the ordinate and y as the abscissa, you see that the, the trajectories evolve always in mathematical positive direction. Yeah? So they rotate in this direction. And as it is a stable limit cycle, they converge asymptotically to the limit cycle, and then they stay on the limit cycle. They never leave it again. Okay? And the limit cycle, the rotation along this limit cycle in the time domain, when you look at y, is of course an oscillation of the amplitude in y. This would be a projection just on the y-axis going back and forth here, okay? So the limit cycle, as you see, it's not a circle. Yeah? A circle would give you a harmonic oscillation, but it is some other shape. It is a general shape depending on your nonlinear characteristic. Nevertheless, you get some oscillation with some amplitude and frequency in your output y. Okay, now, as you can see here, rule 4.1 says that this limit cycle is called stable if a trajectory starting in its neighborhood approaches the limit cycle for t goes to infinity. Okay, so asymptotic uh, approach to as it is stable. Now, go to rule 4.3 first. A limit cycle is called unstable if all the trajectories start in the neighborhood move away from it. This is quite clear. If you start in the vicinity of the limit cycle, but the trajectory moves away from the limit, wherever it ends, yeah, we're not interested where the trajectory ends, but it does not end on the limit cycle. Therefore, it's an unstable limit cycle. And of course, there is something in between. Rule 4.2 says that the limit cycle is called semi-stable if trajectories on one side approach the limit cycle, would be the inside, for instance, and on the other side, for instance, the outside, uh, they move away. Okay, So this is a strange behavior, but it can be encountered in reality, and therefore you need this, def uh, this definition. Okay. We have seen these cases. We have seen both these cases uh, for two semi-stable limits. Uh, stable is here, unstable limit is here. So this figure should be correctly named and you have two semi-stable limits. Okay, Semi-stable because on one side it approaches, on the other side it moves away. Okay, so these have been definitions that make sense. And we're now going to define the describing function. Yeah. The describing function will be a simplification of how this nonlinearity affects our system. Okay, because uh, how the nonlinearity affects a linear dynamic system is really complex. And the describing function aims to say this complex behavior 
and we will see under which conditions we can use such a describing function. Okay. So just to do some name dropping here, this is also called the method of Krylov and uh, Bogolyubov, apparently two mathematicians from Russia who described this method. Uh, and the basis is the approximation of this nonlinear system by simple linear methods. So we want to, uh, to uh, approximate this combination of this nonlinearity and the linear transfer function in the control loop by one simple linear. Okay. When you look at the uh, static nonlinearity, is you can see that uh, all of these were odd symmetric. Yeah, this odd symmetric uh, characteristic is uh, important because it helps in computation. Nevertheless, uh, you could do it also with uh, very general forms of nonlinearities, but then of course computation is a little bit more tedious. Okay. Now, what is uh, what about the prerequisite? What do we need to uh, assure if we want to apply this? Yeah, if we want to apply this describing function to such a system, we must assume that g of s, this linear transfer function, is a low pass filter. Okay, so this low pass filter characteristic that we want to assume for G of S is necessary, it's a necessary prerequisite because it will filter out higher order distortions. Higher frequencies will be filtered out. Okay, uh, how is this meant? Look at this simple picture that you have here above uh, formula 4.1. You have the static nonlinearity you have the transfer function with low pass filter behind it. Now E, assume that E, the control error, is really a sinusoidal function, is a harmonic function. Then of course, if this sinusoidal function has an amplitude that is large enough to come into the saturation region, it will be cut off. So in your control signal U, you will see you have these peaks cut off and they are just horizontally, meaning you have sharp edges here. Yeah. And this is, of course, uh, the, how should I say, this is the effect of the nonlinearity, yes. And it introduces also higher order frequency in the spectra of this. We will come to that in a second, okay? But Whenever you're filtering such a signal through a low pass filter, all these higher frequency components will be attenuated. They will be removed from the signal. And what is left over is the original frequency, the lowest frequency contained in this signal, and all the higher frequencies are gone, meaning that you again have approximately the harmonic function that you had before but of course as you have seen you have cut away some of the amplitudes it now has a smaller gain okay so effectively the combination of these two elements is like a gain but the gain that you have depends on the amplitude of your input and now that is something completely because until now in linear systems, there was a gain and the gain was fixed. It was a constant. If I had a very large input signal, it was attenuated by the same factor as for a very small input amplitude. Now here, the situation is different. The gain between E and Y depends on the amplitude of E. And that is the key to understanding the describing function. It's an amplitude-dependent gain that we approximate this complex system with, okay? Now, the math behind this is that we can split up any signal, for instance, 
we can also split up our signal U with this nonlinear behavior into a Fourier series, okay? Please note this is an infinite series with Fourier coefficients, A, N, and Fourier. And the Fourier coefficients multiply the cosine and the sine components that we're adding up here to get in a result a nonlinear system. Okay. So this is a standard form of representing a very general signal. And I'm trying to switch here to another slide. Just uh, one second. I'm changing to this uh... okay. So you can see here this uh, slide where you see a Fourier series, for instance, for the uh, square signal, okay? And when you see the square signal, the Fourier series, of course, you see the dots. It's an infinite series. And you see the components. This is important to watch, OK? You have A0. That we are not interested in A0. So the constant, because of the operating point, always drops away, OK? You, you don't have to regard that. But you have A1 cosine of t plus and now you see cosine of 2t, cosine of 3t, plus higher frequencies, OK? So there are higher frequencies in your signal now, and they make up for the nonlinearity, yeah? The same is true, of course, for the sine components. You can see you always have here the higher frequencies. And now what we are doing is we are skipping all the higher frequencies. With, we are simply disregarding all those components. And why is this justified? Well, again, I'm going back now to uh, the lecture notes. Because when you look, when you look at our uh, system and our assumption, this is a low pass filter. This low pass filter makes sure that all the other components that are here in this infinite series can be left away. Okay? So we don't need all the higher frequencies, cosine of 2 omega t, of 3 omega t, and so forth, but we just skip them and we're only looking at this input here cosine omega sine of omega t, okay? So this is the basic frequency, the same frequency as the input, yeah? This is the core assumption, the core approxim uh, approximation and simplification. And you see, uh, the general uh, prerequisite is that the relative degree of our linear transfer function must be equal to or larger than two. So the general assumption is if this condition holds, then this is an effective low pass filter and we only have to look at the basic frequencies here of our output. Now, if this is the case, it's very simple. If you look here at this input equation, E equals E bar, E bar is the amplitude of our input, E bar sine omega t, we can divide this here, E of t by E bar, we get this simple equation. Yeah? And now we can, of course, differentiate with respect to time. You see, you have sine of omega t. This will be cosine omega t, but divided by, uh, uh, multiplied by omega. So we have now bring omega down here. And of course, you have y dot on this side. Okay. So this is just obtained by differentiating the first equation here. So now we can represent cosine and sine in this equation here for u by our input signal and the input amplitude. This is nice now, OK? We have our input presented by fixed coefficients 
by the input amplitude and the input signal and its derivative respective. Okay. Now, this is a proportional and differential uh, equation. Okay. And uh, as I said, this is a model of how our nonlinearity works on the whole system. And of course, if the nonlinearity is now in a general form, meaning u is some f, some function, some nonlinear static function, we can be still open Fourier coefficients a and b by these standard equations here. Okay. If this is something that you cannot relate to, please look it up in your math books, go to the internet. But this is the standard formulation of how to compute the Fourier coefficients. And again, we only need to compute two coefficients, the coefficients for the cosine and for the sine factor, okay? Because all the other components with higher frequencies are simply neglected of the low pass characteristics okay so if we can compute this then we have a laplace transform of our nonlinearity yeah that is of our approximated nonlinearity this is just an approximation in the laplace domain yeah? because in general linears there exists a function okay so this is important that uh, you remember no possibility for a general nonlinear transfer function, but in our approximated version, it's very well possible. Therefore, you see this, I would say, is the nice outcome of the approximation. This is why we did it, because now we are back in our linear world. Now we can apply all the linear uh, methods of analysis, for instance, also stability analysis. Okay? And even more, if you replace S by J omega, okay, so we're using here a complex frequency to replace S, you see that omega, the frequency, cancels out. So what you get now is a description of this describing function where only the amplitude of the input is nothing. Okay. This is also important because this tells you this is a system that does not exhibit inner dynamics, but this is effectively working like a gain. It is just working like a gain, but the gain depends on the amplitude of your, yeah? that, that is the strange thing that I told you before, the gain of this transfer block depends on the input amplitude, okay? So this is what in this remark is again said, although we originally started out as a frequency function, S equals J omega, we find that omega cancels out and it's only dependent on E bar on the amplitude of your input. Second important remark, the imaginary part of the complex describing function can be calculated as given in formula 4.6 that A is proportional to the area that is contained inside the hysteresis loops. So you have this hysteresis loops here. And the area inside these hysteresis loops. And therefore, when you have a description of your nonlinearity, you just measure out and calculate F, and you have immediately this uh, Fourier factor A as a function of F and your input amplitude A bar, E bar. Okay? On the other hand, if you know that you don't have any hysteresis, then you don't have f, f equals zero, and you don't have a, meaning that, look at this description here, this Fourier coefficient here for the cosine is identical to zero. You don't have to compute it. You know it immediately if you just look at your nonlinearity. Yeah? So that's a, a strong
because it's also in the, the mathematics that's done here yeah you need to do some integration by parts uh, by uh, choosing a integration variable this uh, is effectively avoided and you come up with a very simple computation that really gives you the result that was stated okay uh, please go through it by yourself uh, it's i think uh, a good uh, example and exercise for you to get again acquainted with those integrals because you need to solve it uh, for specific examples okay now i've told you the uh, basic concept and the purpose of the describing function but i think it really becomes obvious when you see an example how it is done so we're looking at a describing function here of this three-point relay with hysteresis so this is really what is given to you in this example okay and what you should be doing now is to add some additional sketches look at the uh, uh, axis here on the abscissa you have e the control input uh, the control error sorry control error that is the input to the nonlinearity, and the output of the nonlinearity is your control variable u okay so you add two additional plots and please look at these plots yeah in this plot here the time axis or rather the angle because omega t yeah, is going downwards while in this plot you have to read it classically from left to right yeah so it's important that this is to be read from uh, the upper part of the page to the lower part okay that's going downwards omega t now if we have a harmonic input with this large amplitude input then this input will be distorted when going through this uh, characteristic to the function u of omega t that is given here and the important thing what you need to draw is to draw here at first the uh, sine function a very general sine function and then you're looking at the important points where something happens in your nonlinearity. For instance, as long as the sine function stays in this area here between zero and epsilon with its amplitude, which is until it's reaching the angle alpha, it is zero. So you plot exactly the same distance alpha here on the same axis this is the omega t axis horizontally this is omega t axis vertically so exactly after alpha is reached you're switching from zero to a okay this is a this is the amplitude of u when you're crossing the switching point and when are you going back well please remember that you're now moving back along the hysteresis meaning you're going down not to epsilon but even further to q times epsilon and once you reach q times epsilon you're jumping back to zero and this is happening when omega t equals some value beta so you're going here in your harmonic uh, function you're uh, marking where is beta reached and then you plot beta here on your horizontal omega t axis and you switch switching back to zero, okay? And now, as this is an odd symmetric nonlinear characteristic, the very same thing happens when you go to the negative part of the sine function, only in the other direction. And you're starting, of course, now from pi, but everything happens exactly the same when you're going away from pi, only with the sine reversed. Okay, I think this is clear. This must be happening. Yeah? Uh, important is that you find out this alpha and these beta values, and alpha and beta, of course, depend on the amplitude and on the sine and cosine functions. 
how do you compute it? Well, it's quite simple. E bar times uh, sine of alpha equals epsilon. That's the basic equation. You rearrange it, you differentiate it, and you get the equation for cosine. The same is done for the next switching point back again for beta. So you're writing down E bar times sine beta equals Q times epsilon. You rearrange it, you differentiate it, and you get those equations which you will need to replace your expressions later on. Okay. So this has been just the sketch, finding the important points, writing down the equations which define those important points on the omega t axis, and then you're doing the calculation for these Fourier factors. Okay. So these Fourier coefficients now need to be calculated. Of course, this is a simple point where you input u of omega t into this uh, integral, okay? You multiply it, of course, by sine omega t for b. You multiply it by cosine omega t for a. But you don't need to compute a explicitly because we have this nice formula. Yeah? We have this formula, where is it? 4.6, okay? So a is not computed using the Fourier integral, but we are rather using this formula here, going much faster. For B, however, we need to do the computation with the integral. We insert here uh, in parts, okay? We have to integrate from zero to two pi over a full period of the signal, yeah? What are we going to do? We need not go from zero to two pi, because we know that this is anti-symmetric, it's odd symmetric, okay? A times sine, which has positive values here, yeah, and A is positive, will deliver exactly the same as minus A times the sine function in this area, yeah, between pi and two pi, because it's also negative. It will effectively in the multiplication become positive. So what we're doing here is we're just integrating from alpha to beta because everything else here between zero and pi is zero already. So we're only integrating from alpha to beta and we are integrating over A times sine of omega t and we're multiplying this by two because there is the second part which will have the same sign effectively because here it's minus a and it's a negative value of the sine function, meaning two times this integral is the full Fourier integral over from zero to two pi, okay? So this is the trick that you simplify your integral here. And then of course, you just have to do the integration. A is a constant, okay? So you can pull it outside of the integral. It's a very simple thing you have to do to the integral of sine is minus co. Then you have to insert uh, the uh, upper and lower limits correctly. And finally, you come up with your E coefficient. And because of you, you get the amplitude of your input now explicitly in your Fourier coefficient. And if you insert this together with F in the final formula, you come up with the describing function of your nonlinearity, okay? And please note that this describing function, as we have uh, now defined it, is only valid for E bar divided by epsilon larger one. What does it mean? go back here? It means that the amplitude E bar really exceeds the second switching point, okay? So that we really get out of epsilon, okay? The input amplitude must be larger, otherwise we are never going to this switch here. And then it's effectively another nonlinearity that we're looking at because you would be staying just in the zero region, okay? Then it's trivial. It's not longer of any interest. So, but this is important that you say, okay, only if your amplitude is larger than the switching point, then this is a valid
produce a complex value fund, which is effectively some gain to the input depending on the amplitude of your input signal. Of course, depending here on the factor Q, you get different describing functions, you get different behavior. You see if Q, this factor here, which diminishes out, uh, epsilon, goes to one, then you don't have any hysteresis anymore. And if Q goes to one, it's, it's uh, clear that the imaginary part is shrinking until it's gone, okay? So for Q equal to one, you don't have any imaginary part anymore because your hysteresis is gone. Okay, now we have only computed the describing function and we are doing this uh, once again, okay? Uh, We're now looking at the simple saturation function. This simple saturation function uh, should be now evaluated. We want to have the describing function for it. One question before, if the amplitude of the input is smaller than B, yeah, this lowercase b, if this is smaller than b, do we need a describing function at all? Well, everybody knows the answer. If the input amplitude is smaller than b, we're only going along this linear function anyway, and this is a linear gain, okay? We're not reaching the saturation, and therefore it's a purely linear gain, a constant gain, we don't need to describe it. Everything is there. We're in the linear world and we don't need it. Okay, fine. But what happens if we exceed this, uh, this um, threshold here? If we exceed with our input amplitude the value of B, then we will go into saturation. We will cut off the output signal as it is uh, sketched here. And in this case, we need the describing function very well, okay? So let's sketch for this reason an input amplitude E bar larger than B and look at this function here. What is happening here? Well, we're going along with our input up this uh, linear function until we reaching E and then we have a switch to a constant value, okay? So alpha is an important value here because as long as we exceed B, we only have A as an output for our control variable. And once we go back lower uh, than B, then again, we're switching back to our uh, normal output signal, which is somehow scaled by this uh, linear function here, okay? Please note that in the sketch of u, this is a sine function. So th these are not linear functions here, okay? The slopes are members of the sine function, which is cut off here by plus and minus a, yeah? So you have here a sine function, you have constant a, then again the sine function, yeah? This is important to notice. Another thing is that now we don't need to compute from zero to pi our integral, but we know everything if we compute it from zero to pi divided by two, because the second part here, this quarter here, will be identical to this quarter. And therefore, we don't need to compute even from zero to pi, but only from zero to pi divided by two. Okay, this is something that we can see from the symmetry of our output function here. Okay, so we only are interested in alpha. And of course, we can now compute uh, this value of alpha, which is the arc sine function of P divided by E bar. This is a, a simple geometric uh, calculation. You just write it down. I don't think that this should pose any problem. Uh, and then for the output, you obtain that you have this scaled version A divided by B is the slope here, yeah, A divided by B times the input amplitude E bar times sine of omega T. This is the original input signal. 
And this is true if we are inside here of the saturation. And once we are crossing the saturation threshold, we simply have this constant A. There is nothing else, just A. It's very simple then. Okay. So we're writing this down. And we now come to computation of B. Remember, we don't have a Fourier coefficient A because we don't have hysteresis. Therefore, we don't have this surface. This is zero and therefore A is. Okay, so we have now two integrals that we have to look at. These two integrals are this first small, it, it looks like a triangular part, but it isn't because this is the sine. Okay. So first we have to integrate the sine function from zero to alpha. This is done in the first integral. From zero to alpha, integrate the sine function. You see you have sine squared here because A divided by B e bar times sine of omega D multiplied by sine omega. This gives you sine squared of omega. Okay. And the second part is from alpha to pi divided by two. And this is just a, a very simple integral. So you get as a Fourier coefficient, a times sine of omega t from alpha to pi divided by two. And of course, the whole bracket that you get here, you have to take it by multiplied by four. Okay, four times this bracket is the overall contribution over one period. This is how you compute the Fourier coefficient. Of course, this can be done. You come up with the formulation where you have uh, cosine of alpha. You have here also uh, sine of alpha you can uh, express here. And then you can insert it and you get the final expression. And here you can see that the final expression is split up in two cases. Either you have a very, uh, or you have an amplitude of your input smaller than the threshold of the saturation, then your nonlinearity effectively is just a linear gain. It's fixed. It does not depend on the input amplitude, okay? Because it's a fixed gain. But if you exceed the threshold and the saturation really kicks in, you get this describing function a little bit complex you don't see the effect of what is happening here but you can see it in this graph okay if you look at the describing function depending this is everything is normalized this is the let's say this is something like the gain that you're looking at yeah and this is proportional to your input then you can see for small amplitudes uh you have effectively no nonlinear distortion. Yeah, your input amplitude is exactly your output amplitude. You are with one, but as soon as saturation kicks in, which is here, yeah, the effective gain of this nonlinear transfer uh, block is growing smaller. It's growing ever smaller. Yeah. And it's really going asymptotically to zero. So for very large amplitudes, most of your input amplitude will be cut off. It will be cut away. So for large amplitude, it looks as if only a very small portion of your signal gets through. And therefore, for large amplitudes here to the very right, you get a very small equivalent gain, meaning that you, see, you can see it here, the slope of n here is one for small amplitude, sure for growing amplitudes, the slope of this equivalent gain is going down, down, down until it's really flat, okay? So this is telling you that we're looking at an amplitude dependent gain as an approximation of the nonlinearity, okay? So I um, think it's a good, uh, point uh, in the lecture to ask if there are any questions right now with uh, the definition and the computation of the describing function. Please. Yes, a question. Um, how do we um, make the scaling part of the output function in this example, the A over B? 
Uh, you mean that the lowercase a over b? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I understood your question. Please, can you pose it again? Um, how um, did we come to this? So um, what does it mean? Ah, well, it's very simple. A over b is the slope of this linear function, okay? A divided by b, yeah, A is this distance divided by B is the slope of this function. So if we uh, put this input here into this linear function here, the output will just be input amplitude times this slope, because the slope is the same thing as the gain of this system here. Yeah? The nonlinearity in this case is not a nonlinearity. It's just working as a gain. And this gain is A over B. So the okay. output amplitude is the input amplitude with A over B as a gain multiple. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this var um, varies just from um, nonlinear system to nonlinear system. So it's every time different, I assume. Yeah, A and B are just parameters of your nonlinearity. Yeah. It really okay. Depends. It, it, it depends on your system. A and B could be identical, then it's trivial. Yeah. But then you really have unit gain for small amplitudes until the saturation kicks in. Uh, but but it could be any value. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a, a general derivation of a saturation. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, where the you said the hysteresis when there no hysteresis, um, we don't get a A factor yes. of, uh, um, why is it so? Because of this equation here, 4.6. 4.6 says that this relation always holds, you have the proof afterwards, yeah. And this relation that A, this Fourier coefficient is somehow negative proportional to the area of your hysteresis loops. If you don't have a hysteresis loops, this area will be zero, and therefore A will be zero. Yeah, that there, there is no uh, other possibility. Very simple. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, so I will go forward to this part where we are now, as we can compute the describing function, we are now using this describing function to find out if there exist limit cycles and as a consequence, if these limit cycles are stable, unstable, or semi-stable. Now we're in the situation that we can explicitly compute nonlinear describing function n with the argument of your input amplitude E bar. This is something that we can achieve now. And now we're looking at the complete control loop because we not only have this describing function followed by this linear dynamic function, but we also have feedback here, okay? And you're only looking at this uh, standard uh, Hammerstein model because you know if you have uh, here preceding transfer functions and following transfer functions, uh, you can just add them in series, but they don't affect stability, yeah? They are just added in series. They're, they're doing some scaling, they're adding some phase delay, but stability is really a matter of this feedback loop. And inside the feedback loop, we only have these two elements, which we can now fully and uniquely describe. Okay, this is the reason why we're just looking at this here, when we're looking at finding limit cycles and analyzing the stability. So what we have here on this page basically is uh, just recapitulating what we did in the fundamentals of control. Yeah? We have a standard control loop. Yeah? You, you could look at 
this nonlinear describing function as the controller transfer function. Therefore, the open loop transfer function is a multiplication of the plant transfer function times the controller transfer function. And please observe, I said that the nonlinearity cannot be switched with the linear part. It's not commutative, yeah? but now I did exactly that. You see, I, I put G in front and N comes afterwards. Why is this correct? Yeah, because this now is the describing function. And the describing function is, again, a linear transfer function, which is not frequency dependent, but depending on the input amplitude. But it's a linear approximation, and therefore now I can do and treat it like a linear system. Yeah? Okay, that being said, I can again say, okay, this is the open loop transfer function. And now if I want to look, look at the closed loop dynamics, I know this is GO of omega plus one equals zero. This is then the characteristic equation that I have to evaluate. And I can reformulate this. Uh, you remember the simplified Nyquist criterion for stability. There we used this formulation where we said, okay, uh, actually, we have to look at this equality that the plant transfer function G of J omega equals minus one divided by the describing function. Okay? This is the closed loop dynamics that we're looking at. Yeah? Now, uh, if we are using the simplified Nyquist criterion, then the closed loop is as its stability limit, and therefore, when we have stability limit, we have the possibility of undamped oscillation. If two conditions hold, okay, this GO, the open loop transfer, must be equal to one in its amplitude. Okay, so the amplitude equals to one. This is the critical point minus one on the real axis that we are just crossing. And as you can see in this sketch, the argument is minus p, okay, minus pi. Therefore, we have the argument of GO is minus pi, which we can reformulate again. And we can say, okay, the amplitudes of the plant and the negative inverse here of our describing functions must be, which means they must intersect somehow because the argument must also be identical. The same argument means that I'm going along uh, some, I would say, some uh, beam which is uh, radiating out from the origin. I go along this uh, beam, and then I find an intersection of the two functions. And only then a limit cycle can exist, OK? This is stated here in the text again. A limit cycle can only exist if the two, it is called loci, yeah, intersect. But effectively, this is the Nyquist plot of your plant, and this is the Nyquist plot of your describing function, to be more correct, of your negative inverse describing function. Okay? So you have to do some calculations here again. You have to plot the Nyquist plot of your plant, and then you have to check if you have an intersection of the two, because then you have a limit cycle. And once you found a limit cycle, the last question that you have to check is, is this limit cycle that exists, yeah? I proved now the existence, but is it or is it unstable? Maybe it's also semi-stable, okay? So this is uh, a quite interesting question that we have the tool to find the limit cycle, that we analyze the limit cycle, is it stable or unstable? Now, the thing to do is simply use the uh, Nyquist criterion and check what is happening in the vicinity of this intersection, okay? So you're going to the intersection and then you're looking left and right to the intersection and you're checking what is happening. And it's, it's very clear, yeah? Uh, I, please go through it, read it again, 
and think about it, yeah, the best thing that you can do is that you uh, look at these graphs that you find here for stable, unstable, semi-stable and stable. Look at the graphs and really put your finger here where these dots are on the real axis and go through the arguments that you find in the text. Yeah? Because it's important that you find that here, first of all, yeah, as you have an intersection be between uh, G, your uh, plant's transfer function, and N, sorry, minus 1 divided by N, so the negative inverse describing function, you have an intersection, there exists a limit side. So that is the first important thing to memorize. When you have this, uh, the existence of the limit cycle proved, then you go to the vicinity of this uh, intersection. And as it is written down here, you're asking yourself, what is happening here? And the important thing, because you look at the sketches, they always look the same. What is written down yeah, with the distances here, it's the same. The only thing that differs is now this little arrow here, okay? This little arrow, how is this uh, describing function, how it is parameterized? And you see here it is starting with zero, zero amplitude, and it's going from right to left with increasing amplitude. While here, for the unstable case, yeah, you see that the amplitude diminishes from left, uh, uh, sorry, that the amplitude grows from left to right, from zero to infinity, okay? And this makes all the difference because uh, when you look at this case, that the amplitude here on the left case, it is smaller than the critical case. And then you check the stability criterion and you find, okay, in this case, the amplitude is smaller. Stability criterion says, in this case, it's unstable. So it will increase and it's moving towards this point here. Okay? It's moving towards the limit cycle when you start on the inside, small amplitudes. What is when you start on the outside with large? Then you find the stability criterion tells you, well, this is then stable and the amplitudes will diminish. Now, from the outside, amplitudes will diminish. From the in inside, it will increase. The only case that can be is that this limit cycle is stable. From wherever you're starting, you always push towards this limit cycle. So it's a stable limit cycle. Here, everything is the same except for the parameterization of your amplitude. And therefore, it reads completely the opposite. If I have a smaller amplitude as the limit cycle, I am stable, meaning I'm going away from the limit cycle, I'm going into a stable focus, okay? On the other hand, if I'm larger than the limit cycle, I'm unstable, I'm pushed away from the limit cycle, this is an unstable limit cycle. And here, please note in the third, uh, the third uh, figure, figure C here, you have arrows going in both directions. So it depends yeah, if you're going up or if you're going down. If you're going uh, up, uh, the, the, the first pass of this limit cycle gives you a first limit cycle, and the second pass gives you a second limit cycle. And the first limit cycle really is in the other direction. I'm sorry, I have to, to make a short break. I'm back in a second, sorry. So I'm back here again. So this this is, I think, uh, you can really learn this by heart because it's always the same situation in the graphical representation that you will find. It's either stable, going in this direction, unstable, going in that direction, or you have this more complex case here. Nevertheless, the only thing that can happen is when you have hysteresis, 
you're not moving along the real axis, but you're somewhere here with a, a complex part of your function. But otherwise, they are always the same situations that you will find in this figure. Okay? So this is here just in text what I explained to you. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll ask a question right now before we go to the example. If somebody really uh, lost the explanation, if there are some questions right away, please. Okay, I, I fully understand if you don't have any questions right now. I think this is something uh, more complex, something really new, and you have to go through it. And I also I strongly advise you to go through your basic course of control uh, and to look into the uh, simplified uh, Nyquist criterion, just to have it ready and to understand everything that you are making use of. Okay, so let's go through one last example for today. Okay, sorry, I have to make a short interruption again. So this is one of the disadvantages of the home office, but uh, now I'm here. We're looking at example 4.5. Uh, consider this nonlinear control system that we had before. So this is, for instance, room heating. Yeah. Again, you have a two-point hysteresis controller. In this case, it's really the controller. And you have some plant, which is really, you see the difference between uh, numerator, denominator, polynomial is two. So it's a low pass filter. The prerequisites for applying the describing function are fulfilled. So what should we do now? Amplitude and angular frequency of a possible limit cycle should be analyzed and the stability should be determined, okay? So, we don't have to compute the describing function again because we did it in general before. Yeah? So we're using the results from example 4.3. We're just setting the uh, variables to the specific numeric values and we're getting a specific describing function. Please note, our nonlinear characteristic contains a hysteresis and because of the hysteresis, we have also this coefficient a, which is now not zero, but it's this value. Yeah? And the value here corresponds, of course, to the area of the hysteresis. Now, what you need to do with this function is compute the negative inverse describing function. Yeah? If you have to compute this uh, by yourself, please make sure that you do it correctly. Go through this by yourself as a homework, because this is simple calculus. Yeah? There, there is not uh, really uh, some, some trick involved, but you have to make sure that you come up with the right result. What you will find here is that the imaginary part is a constant, okay? So as I said before, now you're not going along the real axis with your inverse negative describing function, but you're going on a parallel, which is somewhere depending on your hysteresis, yeah? on the specific size of your hysteresis. Nevertheless, the situation in the vicinity of this uh, intersection and of the limit cycle that exists here is the same as before, okay? So again, you're going, you're, you're, first thing is, yes, we have a limit cycle. Okay, you find out we have a limit cycle because we have this intersection. Yeah? Therefore, you have to plot this negative inverse. You have to plot the uh, Nyquist plot of your plant's transfer function. And then you find this intersection. And then you're going in the vicinity of your intersection. 
you find out that this is parameterized starting here from zero, going to infinity to the far left. Therefore here, and it's explicitly written yeah, because it's important. Here you have a, uh, ampli an amplitude smaller than the amplitude of the limit cycle, meaning you're starting here at the inside. And here you have an amplitude larger than the limit cycle. So these are the important things that you have to find out yeah, and, and really write it down because then you cannot mix it up yeah, and, and lose track of it. Meaning when you're inside and you're checking for stability and you find, okay, this is unstable, then your trajectory is pushed towards the limit cycle. If you're outside and you find that you're stable in this case, then you're again pushed towards the limit cycle because you have diminishing um, amplitude, okay? Uh, and this is what you have to do here. This is what you have to check. And therefore you find out that you have the stability cycle and you find out that this uh, limit cycle is stable, as I told you before, okay? This is something that you can do purely from the sketch. This is a qualitative um, finding. You don't need to compute anything. You just need to make this sketch and to interpret it. That's nice, okay? The second thing is, the question is, how large is the amplitude and at what frequency does it run, okay? And it's completely clear that the amplitude is only defined by the describing function. This is the parameterization of the describing function. And the frequency is given by your transfer function. And if you look at the complex plane, then these two functions must be identical at this point. And therefore, for instance, in Cartesian uh, coordinates, you set up these two equations that real parts and imaginary parts at, <coughs> sorry, at the limit cycle, there is one S missing here, I just see, okay? So when the limit cycle exists, then these two equations must hold, this intersection exists. Therefore, you see from the first equation, imaginary part of the describing function does not depend on E bar. Therefore, you always have one equation where you can explicitly calculate omega. So that's the first thing that you can compute. And then once you have omega s, you go to the second equation and you see here you have E bar, that is what you want to know. And on the left side, you have omega s. You can insert omega s now and you explicitly get the value of E bar for the limit cycle. So now you know the existence because you have the intersection. You know stability because of the situation in the vicinity of this intersection, and you know the exact numeric values of the frequency and of this amplitude, okay? And now back to the, the interpretation of this case, when you think of this as a control system for heating, for room heating, then of course it's important to have these numeric values, yeah? Because of course, this would be a much too high frequency for room heat, yeah? Because you don't want your control valve to switch every four seconds, yeah? Again, you also don't need to have a temperature which is accurate to 0.15 uh, degrees Celsius. That's not necessary. Uh, typical room thermostats, uh, they are accurate with, uh, for instance, plus minus 0.5 degrees Celsius, and then you also get a very much lower frequency, okay? But the thing is, if you want to design such a control loop, it's difficult to find the, I would say, optimal parameters right away. Nevertheless, whatever parameters you choose for your controller, you can check it afterwards, and once you have done the calculation, for instance, implemented in MATLAB, you can very easily and quickly change numerical values and find out what is the effect on the dynamics of the system. So you can really do uh, a meaningful 
and systematic design of such a conflict. Okay, this second example, which is also a long example, I will do the next time. This uh, next time should also be um, some part of going through what we have learned with uh, the described. So at the end of this presentation, I'm just asking, are there any questions up to now? Please pose any questions that you have, please. I have a question, but it's about uh, the organization. Uh, you okay. said at the beginning that there is a lab at the end of the course thing. Um, when will the uh, when can you sign for uh, for for the lab? I mean, I can found on Tuvo. Yeah, I mean, uh, good question because actually nobody knows what will be at the end of the course. Uh, we know that uh, these measures of shutting down the, uh, I would say, the normal operation of our offices and labs will be going on for several more weeks, mm -hmm. if not months. So it's, it's very well possible, and this is not decided yet, that uh, TU Vienna uh, will extend the semester into the official um, time of summer. Yeah? So mm -hmm. uh, the, the vacation will still be part of the exercises of uh, maybe also exams, but nobody yet knows. We, we all have to wait how this is going to work out. Uh, what, I what I can guarantee you is that we are trying to make it possible for all of you to pass this uh, course uh, together with the lab. Maybe we have to make some replacement. Maybe we have to hand out homeworks. We don't know yet. Please uh, stay tuned. Uh, as soon as we make a decision, we let you know. Mm -hmm. And one more thing. Um, there is the Seminar Segnungstechnik and uh, I was told I should write an email to the mm -hmm. responsible person for each part of this module. Uh, I I sent you an email a month ago or something, but you didn't reply me, so... Okay, I'm sorry for that, uh, but, but this is definitely due to reasons that I just mentioned. Okay. Um, uh, please, please send me this email again. Uh, right now I'm... I'm... Yeah, halfway set up my home office in, in a good way. So please send it again and I will check. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions for now, of course, I encourage you to post questions uh, also to our university assistants, to Alexi and to Said. Uh, or also to myself. Uh, if this is not the case for today, I say thank you for attending uh, and uh, we'll hear each other in next week uh, again on Discord. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.